Well, hi there. Glad you're back. Today's message is going to be called, Why God Makes Things So Difficult. Why does He make things so difficult? But before I get there, I want to get you up to speed on some things that I've been doing. One is, I just finished writing this book, 300 big pages, and uh, it's called The Real Cause of Obesity. Now, many of you probably don't know, but I've actually gained weight lately uh, for the past six months, but I did it on purpose. Before that, I looked in the mirror one day and I said, hey, big fat John, um, I think you need to lose about 50 pounds. So I set out to do that, but if you know me, you know that I don't do anything without taking notes and writing about it. So I wanted to know what the experience would be going through a, I hate to call this a diet because it's really more of a lifestyle thing. But I went all the way through the diet. I lost my 50 pounds. And if you look at some of my earlier videos, you'll see that I had a thinner face and thinner everything else. So when I finished that, I had to, and I finished it on time, and on time would have been my annual physical with my doctor. So I went to the doctor, and uh, we had that blood test done and all that kind of stuff. And the results of the going on the diet was that uh, I'm on blood pressure medication, and my doctor took half of that away because I didn't need it anymore my what called triglycerides, those are the things that will kill you, that are found in your food, that we eat, and the triglycerides are the things that stick to your arterial walls, and they cause your arterial walls to constrict, hence high blood pressure, stroke, heart attack, and all of those other things, type 2 diabetes it leads to. So eating the wrong foods can kill you, but I ran through the, uh, the book, really initially called Diary of a Dieter, but I'm never satisfied with just doing the simple thing like losing the 50 pounds. My triglyceride count fell from like 253 down to 84, and 84 is almost perfect. 253 is pretty high, meaning the higher that goes, the more your arterial walls are going to get clogged. And every other test from the blood test was, was really like awesome numbers, because I got the written stats, which are found in the book, by the way. So then I decided, Doc, this is what I'm going to do. And I told him up front. I said, I'm going to go back and gain at least half the weight back, another 25 pounds. I want to take another blood test, and I want to see, I want to actually prove that Eating high carbohydrate and wrong foods, sugars, uh, potatoes, all that kind of stuff that's in my book, eating that stuff will lead me back toward obesity. Sure enough, after six months, in fact, I just had my blood test done, the triglyceride count is way up there, uh, well over 200. The cholesterol levels are up higher than they were before. And uh, so the numbers are not really good. And my point in the book was to say that the government is teaching us uh, all about diets and how the food pyramid and all this kind of stuff. And they're into this low calorie thing. Keep it low calorie. The fact of the matter is what they're saying to me, is wrong because the diets that America is on, and you're on a diet whether it's to be thin or to gain weight, believe it or not, by the foods you eat, this is what could kill you, some of these foods. And so I set out to prove that the diet that America and the rest of the world seem to be on um, is one that will eventually kill us, cause us to have strokes, heart attacks, type 2 diabetes. And that is called, I named it the poor man's diet in the book. And the reason I say that is because senior citizens or poor uh, people out of poor neighborhood or just people that just don't care or just don't know 
uh, are eating all of the foods that will eventually cause them to be either seriously ill with the type 2 diabetes and so forth, or stroke. And uh, it's a poor man's diet because it's spaghetti and meatballs that is high carb. It's a lot of sugars, whether it's teenagers, high school, whatever. It's a lot of potatoes, you know, run into McDonald's, grab some french fries and a burger. Now, the burger, surprisingly enough, a lot of meats, fish, eggs, bacon, all the stuff I love to eat anyway, have zero to very few carbs in it. So then I learned to get a uh, shopping list together of all the foods that I want, including desserts. Yep. But anyway, I digress. I want to get back into my message. <clears throat> but I just wanted to tell you what I'm out to, uh, up to. I also have a new program because I'm writing for Amazon, um, the new Kindle. <clears throat> and most books these days are going to be electronic e-books. So rather than a hard cover like this, uh, where you used to go to Borders Books, they're out of business. Everybody is reading their Kindles at the beach and so forth. In fact, I have one now myself uh, that my son bought me for Father's Day. It's a beautiful thing. Broad daylight, you can read the thing. In any event, the program that I'm forced to learn now is how to, to publish my book using that Kindle format. And that should be done and probably up on Amazon by Monday. Uh, the Real Cause of Obesity is the name of the book by John Tyler. Okay, back to the message now. Ever ask yourself this question, why does God make things that happen in life so difficult. Why do we have to go through things uh, that are really severely difficult? Well, there's uh, about five reasons for that and I'm going to enumerate upon those reasons uh, in this message. But I came across a story in the book of Judges, way back in the Old Testament, chapter six and seven. It's a story about Gideon, and I'm gonna have to try to shorten it as much as I can, but Gideon, uh, was a fellow that was just an average Joe, you know, working in the fields. And uh, God was going to use him in a mighty way. When God chooses to use you or me for a specific plan and purpose for your life to do what God wants us to do, he invites us to do it, and then we can either say, no, we don't want to do it, and turn and just go about our own pathway, you know, down the wrong pathway usually, suffering consequences along the way, or we can um, say like Gideon did, okay, we, we'll, we'll do what you say, Lord. So, here's the story. Gideon is uh, going to convince, uh, excuse me, God is going to convince Gideon that going down his pathway, or you, or John Tyler, Going down his pathway leads to victory, leads to blessings, leads to joy, leads to all good things. And going down your pathway leads only to consequences, and the consequences are not too good. Been down that road, bad consequences. But here's what the Bible says. Israel, in Judges chapter 6, verse 1, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, what happened is Israel saw miracle after miracle. God got them out of Egypt, slavery. He parted the Red Sea, as I pointed out in another message. Um, he, he caused miracle after miracle to happen. And guess what? Israel kept turning away from God, the God that they saw doing all the miracles, and they went down their own path like you and I do uh, an awful lot. And we shouldn't be doing it that way. So what happens when you go down that pathway? God says there was a, a, uh, a punishment, unfortunately, or a consequence for the nation of Israel. And what he would do was put them into captivity. Now, what they did, what their great sin was, was the breaking of the first commandment that they had. Thou shalt have no other gods before you, whether it's sports or automobiles or relationships or whatever. When you put other things in front of God, that's having another God before you. God doesn't like it. So there's a consequence of that. Israel's consequence was that they were worshiping Baal. 
Now, Baal was the god of their enemy, just a wooden statue that they built an altar to, and they're worshipping a stick, if you really want to put it that way, a false god. Satan loves it when you worship anybody or anything but Almighty God, because he hates God. So, here we go. They're in captivity in the land where they worship Baal. And the Midianites that surrounded them, they had an army of 135,000 strong men, well-armed, well-equipped men, soldiers. And what the Midianites would do, and what Satan does too, is he just kind of uh, torments Israel. And he torments you when you start heading toward God's pathway. He, he, he caused the Midianite people to come down into the land where Israel was occupying and they would uh, notice their crops growing in the field and they would totally destroy all their crops while the Israelites ran and hid in caves that they had found and built for themselves up in the mountains. They were hiding like little cockroaches that run scared when you turn the light switch on. So the Midianites took them down and, and burn all their crops so they had no food and they torture them even more and punish them even more during their seven years in captivity uh, by taking all the donkeys, their cattle, their sheep, every animal that they had, they bring it back to their house and they would use that for their own food. And the Midianites were too numerous to count and they would come down riding their camels and destroy everything that Israel had. So then Israel, after seven years of this, torture and torment. Israel, it says, cried out to the Lord for help. Oh Lord, now all of a sudden, see they came to their senses like the prodigal son and they said, God, we're sorry for what we've done. We turned our back on you. We'd like to have you help us. And when they cried out to the Lord, it says in verse 7 of chapter 6, because of the Midianites, because of their torment, the Lord sent the prophet to the Israelites and he said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up out of uh, Egypt, out of your slavery. Um, I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you then. I drove out your enemies. I brought you into a promised land, which was the land of your enemies. I gave it to you for nothing. I took care of you. My pathway is nothing but blessing, and you turned your back on me. Hot lights here. You turned your back on me, so that's why you got punished, and that's why you got punished for seven years. Seven is the number of completion. So funny, at the end of the seven years, Israel comes to their senses and begs God, please help me, because we're sick of the suppression. So then it says, the angel of the Lord came to uh, this one called Gideon. He was threshing wheat because he was hiding out in this uh, threshing room floor, threshing wheat inside the building to hide it from the Midianites because that's about the only food that they would have is anything that they could uh, scrounge up and kind of store somewhere. So he was hiding in this wine press actually, uh, threshing grain to keep it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord, some people think that the angel of the Lord was a pre-incarnate Christ. In other words, Christ came to the earth later on, born as a baby in the uh, manger at Bethlehem. But before that, he would come to the earth in the form of an angel called the angel of the Lord. And he would speak to people, and in this case, he spoke to Gideon. And he said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. That's what the Lord said to Gideon. And Gideon turns to this figure that's there and he says, Sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles that our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt and so forth and so on? So then the Lord explained to him, that's why you're in this punishment right now. But he said, I want to tell you this, Gideon, go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites, I am sending you. God chose Gideon to go and rescue Israel from their enemy. God chooses you or John Tyler to go and do certain things within his plan and purpose for our life 
and we can say yes or we can say no, I don't want to do it, and Gideon was going to be faced with that. But God was going to make it impossible, by the way, for uh, Gideon to accomplish what God had set out before him. I'll tell you why in just a moment. And this answers the question, why does God make things so impossible for us when uh, we go, have to go through trials or what we perceive as trials? It's really training. Um, but the Lord replied, replied to Gideon um, and told him the story about why he was there. But then Gideon said to God, he said, how can I rescue Israel? I am the weakest in all my family and my people that are around me are the weakest out of all Israel. How can we possibly uh, go and rescue Israel from 135,000 strong Midianite soldiers. The Lord said to him, I will be with you. The Lord says to you and to me, because when I establish a plan, I'm going to go with you. So we should not have any fear when God sets a plan before us, which I call a trial or a test. We should have no fear. We should just get into it and God will start showing us first base, I'm here, second base, I'm here, third base, I'm here, all the way home to victory. Throughout that trial, God is telling you and me, I will be with you. It's my plan. I've designed it for you specifically, and I'll give you the reasons why he does it and why he makes it so tough for us. And then the angel of the Lord, when he said this to Gideon, the angel of the Lord disappeared. Well, Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord at this point, so he cries out, Oh, sovereign Lord. I'm doomed. I've seen God face to face and I know what the rule book says. When you see God face to face, surely you will die. Well, then the angel of the Lord reappeared and said, you won't die, Gideon. So Gideon named, uh, built an altar to the Lord on that site and the Bible says it remains this day in that land, that same altar. Now, here's first base for Gideon and you will uh, run into a first base situation. In other words, God's going to bring you to a particular level to accomplish His plan which is bigger than first base. Remember, you got to get all the way around the bases to get home. So, He says, I want you to go into the uh, place where Israel is worshipping that false god Baal. I want you to tear that statue of Baal down and I want you to tear down the altar and I want you to build an altar to me in its spot. So he and a few of his friends that night went in and tore down to this worship temple of Baal, false god, tore it down, tore down the altar, built an altar to the Lord. Well, early the next morning, the people uh, that worshipped went there to worship and they noticed Baal was torn down and this altar to Almighty God, the God that they heard about from their ancestors, was... Uh, <clears throat> was was there in its place. And they said, uh, we want to know who did this despicable thing? Who tore down this altar of Baal? And then they learned that it was Gideon, son of a guy called Joash. So they went to Joash's house and they said, uh, we heard that your son Gideon tore down our false god, but they, they didn't believe he was a false god, our god, and built uh, uh, an altar to God Almighty instead. Now coincidentally, Gideon, who was a God-fearing young man, his father wasn't. His father was the one who built the altar and the statue of Baal. Kind of funny, huh? So anyway, they shouted out to Joash, these people, you send your boy out here and we're going to kill him. He deserves to die. So Joash says, look it, he used common sense. He said, look, if Baal, our God, is so strong and powerful, let him deal with this situation. If he is insulted, let him come and destroy my son. That's okay with me. So as soon as Joash says that, old Satan comes right into the scene like he will in your life. As soon as you get on that path toward God, there's Satan. He can't wait to come up against you. Well, what he did was... He arranged for all the armies of Midian and uh, all the surrounding armies who were arrayed against Israel to come down into the land of Israel. 
and uh, gather around. Um, they crossed the Jordan River and, and camped in this little valley down uh, below where there was a stream and a spring and so forth. And here's Israel behind them up here and they're down in the valley. You getting it? 135,000 strong with their camels, their weapons of war, their, they built their tents. They were ready to come in and come up against the nation of Israel to kill them. So it says, then the Spirit of the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit, took possession of Gideon. Now he's going to make him strong. But Gideon, you know, he's like us. He questions God. God, if this really is from you, and if you really want me, and you really think that I can uh, defeat the enemy, then I want a sign. So he says, uh, he took this big woolen fleece, you know, like a rug, if you will, and he put it out in the middle of the field. And he said, Lord, in the morning when I come out, if you would, if you're in this, make that woolen fleece soak and wet and all the ground around it, make it dry. So that was his sign. So next morning he goes out, he takes that fleece, the ground around it's dry, he takes it up and wrings out a total bowl of water, according to verse 38 and 39 of uh, chapter 6 of Judges. So that's not good enough. You know, God already did this and performed the miracle. Just sort of like us. We just need more assurance somehow. So Gideon said to God, well, look, I believe you and you did this and it's a miracle and the ground is dry, but you know, just to make sure, let me put the fleece back out and this time make the fleece dry and the ground all around it soaking wet. He goes out in the morning, the ground is totally soaking wet, picks up the fleece and it's dry as a bone. Now he gets it. Okay, I'm going to do it. So then when he promises God, okay, I'm in your pathway, I'm in your plan, I'm going to go do it, what do I do? He's figuring he's going to go get the nation of Israel that had somewhere around 35 or 40,000 soldiers and they just go up against the 135,000 Midianite soldiers, well armed and big and mean, and defeat them because God said they would. But God said, wait, you got way too many guys. you got way too many soldiers. So ask the people to raise their hand. Whoever wants to go home, send them home. See, this is where God tests you and me too. This is what I call first base too. And so Gideon says to all of his 40-something thousand guys, how many uh, want to not go to battle and just want to go home and, you know, take care of your wife and family. 22,000 of them raised their hands. They didn't want to get involved in God's work at all. Kind of like us, right? Many people, they go to church maybe once a week, but they just don't want to get involved in God's work. So those people God sent home. Then God says, um, you know, you still got too many. I want you to take the rest of your guys <clears throat> and go down to the stream that's up high, really, overlooking this valley where 135,000 of their enemy was. And I want you to have your guys, split them off into groups, and have them, but I want you to observe what they do. Have them drink from the stream. So Gideon looks at his guys, and a lot of them put their swords down, uh, spears, whatever weapons they're using, and they knelt over the brook and then they stuck their mouth right into the water and started drinking from the stream that way, not paying any attention to what's going on around them. So when they got done, he's also noticing others were standing there and they had the spear in, let's say, their left hand and they're observing like a deer would do if she was out in a field and had two fawns with her. They're always observing, their ears are twitching, they're listening for things. Well, these guys were observing, they had their spear in the left hand, and they would cup the water from the stream while they were looking around and drink like that, um, which I think I'll do right now. So God said to Gideon, those are the men that you are going to defeat your enemy with. Everyone else went home, there were 300 guys left, 300. And the Lord said to Gideon, With these 300 men, 
I will rescue you and the nation of Israel, and I will give you victory over the Midianites. See, this is the impossible situation that I'm pointing out to you in this message. And God wanted to tighten everything down so that it was virtually, absolutely impossible for this to happen. The reason God told Gideon, and the reason he wants to tell you and me these days, is uh, several fold, really. But one of the main reasons is if 40-something thousand went up against the Midians, Israelite uh, army would say, we did it, rah, 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 we did it. And God would not get the glory. And people looking at this impossible situation of 300 people going up against 135,000 strong men, it's impossible. So the end result, if they win with 300 men, is Almighty God must have been in that episode. He, that's what God does in your life and my life. Because people who observe me or you in whatever you're going through, let's say like me, I went flat broke in 2007 when I asked God to show me his plan and purpose for my life. Other things happened bad, but uh, it all worked out good because Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose, like Gideon. So here they are, 300 guys at Gideon's, okay, you said that we'd, we'd uh, defeat our enemy. You'd said that you were going to get the glory out of this. Okay, good. We're going to do it. And the Lord said, well, Gideon, I know that you... Hot lights in the middle of July, believe me. Gideon, I know that you're still a little nervous. So what I want you to do is take your buddy here. You two go down into the valley, creep up to this tent that I'm going to lead you to, and I want you to listen to two guys that will be talking in the tent. So timing is everything. See, this is second base now. He had to go down. He had to do something more. And he was going to assuredly gather as he go that God is in this thing. So God had already predetermined the end result of this. So what happens, Gideon and his buddy go down to the tent where the Midianite soldiers were. And they creep up to the tent and they're listening. And one guy is saying, I had a dream to his buddy in the tent. I had a dream last night. Of course, God put the dream in his head. And it was this big, giant roll of barley that represented Israel, apparently. And it came rolling down the hill into the Midianite camp here and flattened the tent. So his buddy, God already had him interpret the dream. He says, yes, I heard about this one called Gideon. And I heard that God is going to go with Gideon and that he is going to defeat us. So that's what your dream was all about. So as soon as Gideon and his friend heard that, he was totally assured that God was in this thing. And he goes back all gung-ho, ready to go. Just as we should be ready to go when God calls us into a plan or a trial, there's a reason for that. And it's always to train us and make us stronger. Like Gideon, he was getting stronger and stronger the more he went through this trial and the more assurance he, uh, he had. So remember, God has perfect timing too because Gideon landed at the tent at exactly the right second to overhear this conversation. So God knows what he's doing. Everything is fine. Now, assuredly gathering as you go, that's Old Testament with Gideon. But if you go over to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wanted to know, where am I going to go next, Lord? See, God has a plan and purpose for your life. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles in the New Testament. Gentiles means non-Jews. So, God put a dream into Paul's head. And in the dream, Paul saw a man from Macedonia saying, come, come. So, when Paul woke up, he and his guys uh, went to Macedonia to preach the gospel. And he was assuredly gathering as he goes, according to uh, Acts 16, 9 and 10. It says this, uh, And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord has called us for to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So you see, God gives you assurances along the way. And in my life, I can tell you that that's true. And I keep thanking him. I said, this is a confidence builder. When you do this and I see it happening, 
like when I came out of my debt situation and God took care of my daily bills, that was first base to me and I gained more confidence that way. And then he started to give me more uh, and that was just in the money thing. We had relationship problems, we had family problems, we had problems with the kids, you name it, and that is being restored and resolved as well along the way. But the big thing was the finances when I was rich and then went broke. And then um, God gave me extra money to start this Samuel Fund and take care of the poor and so forth and so on. So it's a beautiful thing when God is in the, the uh, plan, when He plans it, and when you're in it and willing to go, that's what I'm talking about, that you assuredly gather that you're in the right place at the right time doing God's work. And so when you're going through your trial or your your, what you perceive as to be torment, it really is not. It's a training mission, and God wants to make you come out of it victorious and strong like he will do with uh, Gideon here. So, Gideon was instructed to take your, your guys, take a hundred with yourself, a hundred and another hundred, and surround the camp. And they would have clay jars with a torch inside of it. Clay meaning like you can't see through it, but inside there's a torch going on. Um, so they would carry that and they had ram's horns and Gideon said to his guys, look, just keep your eye on me, I'll be over here, you keep your eye on me and do exactly as I do. When I come to the edge of the camp, just do as I do. As soon as uh, you hear me blow the ram's horn, blow your ram's horns and then shout out loud, the Lord this is for the Lord and Gideon, because God has already told them what's going to happen to them. They're going to be defeated. So it was just after midnight at the changing of the guard with the Midianites that um, they blew the ram's horns all the way around their camp. That's all they heard is, uh-oh. And then they busted those clay pots, and now you're seeing the torches after they hear the horns, they see all the torches and they're figuring they're surrounded and then they they yelled they all yelled out in one loud voice a sword for the Lord and for Gideon and it says each man stood in position around the camp and they watched <clears throat> and here's what happened the uh, the soldiers in Midianite began to scatter from fear what's going on this dream is coming through, because you know, God spread that dream and interpretation of it throughout the camp. So they're all afraid, now they're going to die. So they're out there, they, they're pulling their swords out, and it's dark, remember. Uh, the only thing they see is torches all around the, the camp, and hearing these ram's horns blow, they're surrounded and they're about to die. So anybody that came near them, they killed. So they were killing each other. And then the ones that didn't die from their own swords, while Gideon and his 300 men are up here, high, watching all this happen, God is destroying their enemy by letting them kill one another. The ones that fled off into the mountains and, and other areas, the next day, Gideon sees all the, the uh, desolation in the camp, and he tells now his 40,000 guys who went back home, now let's go attack and let's kill every Midianite we can find and totally destroy the enemies once and for all. So here's why God let him win that victory with only 300 men and he did it, trusted God to do it God's way, which you and I have to learn to do. But God wants us to know, first of all, that when he has a plan and purpose for your life, he works out all the details far in advance so that you don't have to worry. And I don't worry, I just go one step at a time. Every time a door opens, I step through it now because I know the Lord is leading me through that doorway. Remember I said before, before I used to just kick my own doors open, run in there, do things all by myself, and then cry out to the Lord like these people did. Uh-oh, I'm stuck, I did it, I did it wrong, can you help me out? And he would, like he did then. Another reason God lets us go through um, almost impossible situations, or it seems to us it's impossible, he's testing us, like Gideon, to see if we're going to get to first base. A lot of us get to first base, like his troops there, 
and we don't want to go any further. We just say, no, this is too tough. I'm not going to be in the plan. And we go and do down this road and suffer the consequence of going down the wrong road. And those of us who wish to stay on the path, few of us that there are, like the 300, when we go through our trial, everybody's observing, and that's the third reason God wants to get you through impossible situations and tighten it up and make it impossible so that people who know you and know what you're going through, whether it's financial difficulty, bad health difficulty, relationship difficulties, they're seeing you, they're observing you, they're seeing how are you going to react to what's going on around you, and when they see God rescue you and get you to the other end as a victorious person like Gideon and his 300 guys, then the only thing they can do is say, it's a miracle. God worked in your life. God worked in John Tyler's life. And we have known John Tyler, for example, and we knew where he came from because we've been observing him. And God gets the glory and the honor out of this, which is exactly what he wants. Another reason that he does this is because, like the story of Gideon, he had his prophets of old write that down in the book of Judges, uh, the Old Testament, for a reason. And that is he wants to keep the story of Gideon alive. That's why he used Gideon. And the story of Gideon is alive right here to 2013 in this message. So God wants us to continue the story of Gideon to show that if we get on God's path, uh, pathway and plan, if we ask Him to, He'll show us the path that He wants us on. He'll plan everything is already planned for that purpose for your life. And then when you come out through the end of your trials, because He'll put a trial at base one, base two, base three, and all the way to home to victory. And if you pass each of those trials and tests, uh, and they seem to get tougher as you go, uh, and then they start, you're a victorious guy at, or woman at the end of this thing, all you can do is give God the glory and the thanks and the praise, and other people who observe you see that. And so they will give God the glory, meaning they will look to God, they will point to God and say, you know, I want what that person has. And uh, so you're a part of God's plan if you wish to be so. But you got to get the first, second, third base all the way home to victory. Now, are you going through a tough time right now? Financially, physically, emotionally, uh, relationship-wise? If you are, just know this. It's not because God is angry at you. It's because He's trying to teach you, train you, and make you stronger. Now, are you going to panic? You may. I don't know. But here's a verse that I came across in Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, and I'm going to end with this. But it's, it's almost a story about life and what's going on in our society right now. Politics, um, the world in general. It says this, I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation as I close, uh, because it's easier to understand. It says, even the Gentiles, that is non-Jews, now the Jews live by the Old Testament, and they live by the book of uh, five books of Moses. They live by Exodus, for example, where the Ten Commandments are found, Moses' law. But it says, even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know His law when they instinctively obey His law, even without having ever heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written into the hearts of all mankind for their own conscience and their thoughts either accuse them, you're doing the wrong thing, or they, it, it tells them that they're doing the right thing. It says so right there in Romans 2, 14 and 15. So that is exactly right. So what you see in the world today, folks, uh, is this. People do know right from wrong, with or without the Ten Commandments. You may not know what the Ten Commandments are. It doesn't make any difference. God has written the law of his right and wrong into the hearts of all men. But, and the proof of that is, when you get a Supreme Court and politicians who are dictating everything against what the Bible preaches, they know that it is wrong to do it. 
they are actually absolutely changing God's law, which is right, and making it a law that you have to obey doing the wrong things. I give you this uh, DOMA Act and all the rest of this, killing babies. Uh, it's the law now. You can allow babies to be aborted and killed uh, instead of given over to adoption. All of these different things. What's right is wrong now. What's wrong is right according to man who knows better. But they, they know it's wrong. And that's why they're trying to say, well, rather than do what's right, as God has told us to in his word, or that he's imprinted into our hearts, we're going to make laws now saying that what God says is right is not right. So they know it's right, but they want to change it to make it so that mankind says what we say is right is not only right, we're going to make it law so that you have to obey what we say. I don't. If it goes against God's word, no, I'm not obeying it. Plain and simple, there you are, Mr. Obama, I'm not doing it. So anyway, bottom line is this. Uh, if you're running through that trial or that tough time right now, remember this. It's just God's plan, and you're going to be victorious, just like Gideon, but you have to learn to trust God and say, He's going before me. He's got it all planned out. I have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. Just go with it. And with that, I'll see you guys next week with another message, I do hope. See you next week.